Hey guys, it's Michelle with Florida Keys Birding and today we're going to be talking about uh, migration of the indigo bunting. We're going to look at migration patterns on the map and all of that, but first we're going to talk a little bit about some facts about specifically indigo bunting migration, how they migrate, um, some different interesting facts about that, and then we'll go and take a look at the maps. So, um, okay, so the indigo bunting is a nocturnal migrant. They do migrate at night. They use the stars for guidance like most songbirds would. Um, apparently there were some researchers that did demonstrate this process in the late 1960s by studying captive indigo buntings in a planetarium and then they also observed them under the night sky. Um, so during this experiment in migration season, the captive buntings became restless at night. They observed that they oriented their activity southwards in autumn and northwards in spring and um, their main cue to orientation you know was of course the star patterns in the night sky um, shown by Tessa behavior towards star patterns in the planetarium so they were uncertain whether or not magnetic fields played a role and whether it influenced uh, the migratory orientation or not that's something that we know that does affect songbirds migrating at night we don't know how it works but we just know that it works <laughs> I remember that's something that um, my teacher told me in nursing school about a lot of different medications I was like well, well why does that one do that she's like we don't know how it works we just know that it does <laughs> so it reminds me of that um, okay so the birds possess an internal clock that enables them to continually adjust their angle of orientation to a star. Um, even though the stars do move at night, they'll still um, orient themselves based on that. So that works somehow, it just does. Experienced adults will return to breeding sites in the field even when they are held captive through winter and released far from their normal wintering area. So it seems like they know where to go no matter what. They are nocturnal migrant, like I said. Um, so that means that they depart at night and sometimes they still will continue to fly into the daylight. Um, it's unknown how individuals detect direction and wind speeds before they depart on the migratory flight. You know, this is just something, I mean, to me, this is just something that, you know, God put in them to, to know how to, you know, what to do and this instinct to do these things. Um, it seems like it's very, something very complicated and, um, you know, just something that, just doesn't happen for no reason you know it's it's pretty impressive so um, apparently they're not social in flight and they do not call extensively only one record of song in my uh, only there was only one record taken of a song in migration flight um, now I will beg to differ on this because the night that I experienced the fallout I could hear painted bunting and indigo bunting migration calls. I heard it. I have a recording of it. <laughs> you can hear it on the recording on the other video I did about the night I witnessed fallout. And they were calling to each other, okay? So I definitely heard it. I know what I heard. And the next day I woke up to indigo buntings all over the place. So I, I know that I heard calling. It's kind of weird that they say that they only recorded this one time but I know I heard it <laughs> just saying okay so um, during the night flight one estimate of flight speed of migrating buntings was about 32 kilometers per hour or you know in English measurements 19 miles per hour so that's about how fast they fly generally um, so the rate of feeding increases before migration as birds deposit fat um, that's used for fuel to migrate so they need to do that so that they can make it you know across this this long flight you know it's going to be really difficult otherwise so they're going to need to increase around 50 percent in mass so they're going to need to gain you know 50 percent of their body weight um, so in migration season birds <clears throat> become active at night and then will gather in flocks during the weeks before a trans gulf you know leap and other long migratory flights um, so departing in flight at night and sometimes of course they will continue to fly into the day so I have noticed that happening with some songbirds where I'll go out at 7 30 in the morning 
to see if I see or hear any birds and there'll be a few um, maybe don't find a lot and then around 10 30 10 10 10 o'clock in the morning suddenly I'll see a whole bunch show up so I have noticed that with even warblers before so it must be the same with buntings um, and then based on calculations of energy metabolism, a bunting needs about 30% of body mass available fat to complete the nearly 1,000 kilometer or 621 mile flight from the north, uh, north Florida across the Gulf of Mexico. Bunting needs, uh, buntings need about uh, greater than or equal to 18 grams um, you know, of weight that they'll need to, uh, to maintain to have a sufficient flight fuel energy to complete a trans-gulf migration unaided by winds. Now, of course, they're going to, you know, choose those nights where the winds are in their favor so they don't have to use as much energy because it will preserve them, you know, it'll preserve their life if they don't, I mean, imagine you don't make it all the way across. So, I mean, these are things to think about when you're a bird. Um, but apparently they just, they know, they know, they have this instinct, they just know, they know when is the right time and we don't know, we can't predict it, otherwise us birders would just, you know, we would be, we would know, we would be like, hey, today's going to be the perfect birding day. And it happens all the time where you think it's going to be the day and then you go out there and you're like, oh, and you don't find anything and it's so frustrating. Um, that's been the last couple of weeks in the upper keys. <laughs> it has been, but we'll see how it goes. We're, we're not out of peak season yet. We're, we're right in the thick of it. So, um, all right, let's go ahead and take a look at some migration maps and uh, we'll take a look at when, exactly when you can expect them for fall and spring migration. They're already here in the Keys for spring migration right now. I just saw one um, this morning. I saw two this morning and I saw um, a couple. I saw three on Sunday and then on Saturday I saw two. So they're definitely here. All right, let's take a look and we'll see what the patterns look like. Okay, so let's take a look at indigo bunting migration patterns on eBird. Um, so as you can see, we're going to start here around August 3rd. Um, this is the time that uh, migration usually starts. Um, I start to see a few trickle in and then of course peak is like October 1st and 2nd week of October. So, um, so let's take a look at their migration patterns. So as you can see, starting in August, beginning of August, they are up here in the Midwest, they're on the east, they're in the north. Um, there's a few in Florida, but not a whole lot. So let's see how it changes as things head farther south. Okay, so we start to see some movements in the fall. They're in fall migration into Florida and into, let's see, into the Florida Keys into September, end of September, and already into Mexico and Southern Texas and a little bit here in Cuba. And it gets a little bit heavier as we go into, let's see, August 5th, August 12th. Um, that's around the time that I saw them last fall during fall migration. It was around this time. We had got our first cold front. It was an early cold front and we had that fallout that night. Um, day I had indigo buntings everywhere so that was pretty cool um, okay so as you can see they're getting to they're doing that jump over to the Yucatan and they're congregating down here in Florida to jump over into South America and like this is where they're gonna kind of stay throughout the winter so by October 26 they're heavier into Florida late into November they're even heavier into Florida and into Louisiana and there you can see that they're kind of making their way on down and November 9th you know I was still seeing indigo buntings even early November last year. I remember thinking to myself, I wonder if they're going to stay, <laughs> but I don't think that they did. If they did, then they hid all, all winter, but no, I don't think so. So this is November 16th. This is November 23rd. This is November 30th. They're still in Florida. And this is December 7th. Wow. Yeah. So you see, let's zoom in a little bit here. So you can see there's still some left in the Keys, there's still some that stay in South Florida, it looks like, but the most concentration is in Cuba, Bahamas, and into the Yucatan, Mexico, and 
Central America. And it looks like that's pretty much where they're going to stay because you see it gets heavier as you head into late December. But look, there's still some, there's still some here in South Florida. So um, it looks like they kind of stay here around this Okeechobee area. So that's pretty interesting. I didn't even know that. <laughs> so yeah, and they, they leave the keys, it looks like. So, um, and then they're the heaviest, they're the heaviest through these areas. So this is January 11th. Let's see what the movement looks like. January 25th. Jan February 1st, they're still there. February 8th, February 15th, still kind of around the same areas. Um, and now it looks like they're starting to get on the move. They're starting to congregate and move closer together because um, they're getting ready to hop over um, the Gulf of Mexico for spring migration. So this is March 8th, March 15th, March 22nd. Okay, by March 22nd, it looks like we've already got one here in the uh, Key West, and then there's already some showing up like near uh, Fort DeSoto, like Tampa area. Okay, so let's see what else we got going. March 29th, we've got a few showing up in Florida, leaving Cuba here. Um, it looks like they're congregating here in the Yucatan, which is expected for most songbirds that are wintering down here. That's usually what they're going to do. They're all going to come up and they're all going to congregate right here. And they're going to hop over into either Florida or New Orleans, Louisiana, Texas. Um, a lot of them like to go right in this area right here in Texas. So um, April 5th, April 12th, boom. Look at that. They're all doing their... Their, um, trans Gulf jump <laughs> into New Orleans and looks like some into Florida April 19th boom a lot of them they're all showing up here already and some more into Florida um, you know heavy in the Gulf Coast uh, and more into Florida on April 26th by May 3rd we've still got some showing up in Florida and less and less through Central America they're making that stop over they're hopping over the Gulf. They're almost, you know, they're, they're decreasing quite a bit in the Yucatan and they're getting heavier. Look at that all throughout the U.S. Let's back it up a little bit. Let's see. Okay, they went from April 19th, boom, to April 26th, to May 3rd, to May 10th. So we still have some in Florida, but yeah, they're pretty heavy all throughout here where they're going to stay you know, for the summer for breeding. May 17th, they're way up into the U.S. already. So they're already into the Midwest and the Eastern U.S. and up north by May 17th. Look at that, because today is May 2nd. So yeah, they're almost out of Florida. And May 24th, they're pretty much almost out of Florida. May 31st, they're pretty much completely out of South Florida. There's some a few left in North and June 7th, boom, they're already to their breeding grounds or doing their thing. This is where they're going to stay through the summer into their breeding grounds and go ahead and do their baby thing. And that's that. And then June 28th, July 6th, July 13th, they're doing their thing. They're raising their babies. July 27th, August 3rd, and you start to see a little bit of movement again by August 10th. So just a little bit, not much. Um, so yeah, so this is what the map looks like for the migration patterns for the indigo buntings. Um, and then, uh, yeah, you can kind of see where they're just look at that. They even go up into Canada a little bit. So this is kind of their distribution. There is a few over here into the West a little bit, New Mexico, Arizona. Um, so yeah, that's kind of the distribution for migration. All right, guys, thanks for watching as always. And I want you to let me know when you get indigo buntings in your area. Thanks.